Dr. Robert Malone is an internationally recognized scientist and physician. He's also a co-inventor of the mRNA vaccination as a technology. In December of 2021, he made a controversial appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast to speak out about the safety and efficacy of the COVID vaccine. He had already been kicked off of Twitter for misinformation, and after Rogan's show, he was thrown off YouTube. Dr. Malone says he was then systematically canceled by the same government agencies he worked with for decades. The longtime scientific researcher who did get COVID and did take the vaccine says he had a gradual awakening during the pandemic. That when he saw what was being done by some of the most trusted people and organizations, he had to say something. That something was pretty shocking as he laid his case out for a healthcare system run amok. We sat down with Dr. Malone to ask him about his concerns and why he's hell bent on making his voice heard. Health insurance industry, our hospital systems, our scientific press, it's it just it it has been mind boggling what we've encountered. So when you're talking about misdeeds, what specific misdeeds are you referring to? Well, the most recent one is really uh, overt. Uh, we've had the CDC basically be outed by the New York Times, uh, not exactly a bastion of conservative media, uh, in, in acknowledging that the CDC has been withholding data from physicians, public health officials, medical scientists, all the way through this outbreak, potentially in, including the majority of data having to do with the safety of the vaccines and the various parameters relating to the disease, as well as the efficacy of the vaccine. This data has been withheld, and according to the New York Times, the CDC has become fully politicized. It is a political arm of the executive branch. It is no longer an independent adjudicator of truth in terms of public health information, which is what their mission has always been. That's, I think, part of what's confused physicians and medical caregivers so much all the way through this, is the CDC previously, you know, they're not a perfect bureaucracy and they are often inefficient and fairly frequently wrong, but at least there has been some integrity and uh, effort to remain objective and to report information in an objective fashion, that's all gone now. So that's one example. Then there's the, the various manipulations that have occurred by the press, um, by uh, um, you know, media, social media, big tech, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, et cetera. All of that censorship. Were in, you surprised when you were taken off Twitter? Um, Twitter, so at the time I had 550,000 followers, which isn't huge, but it's not nothing. Uh, and it had been built up fairly quickly uh, since the Brett Weinstein Dark Horse podcast. But we had watched many of my colleagues be deplatformed from Twitter for a few months at that point. And then Jack stepped down and the new management came in and they said explicitly they were gonna start deplatforming people. And I knew it was only a matter of time. At that point, I'd already been for months and months self-censoring. So in a way, it was a, a relief. Now, the sin that was committed, apparently, was the reposting of a detailed uh, um, graphic analysis, so kind of a little cartoon, video cartoon, uh, developed by the Canadian COVID Care Alliance that went through and really dissected the Pfizer clinical trials and the data and information manipulation and management that had been done there and the various misdeeds and misreporting, et cetera, that had occurred with Pfizer and then backed by the CDC and the NIH and accepted by FDA. So this, this detailed, completely correct analysis, everything is factual, everything is documented, Posting that was the justification for deplatforming me, and by the way, other people. So when the when it came down, um, and by the way, it was closely followed. People don't recognize it, but only a couple of days later, LinkedIn deplatformed me, and I'm still deplatformed from both. Okay, that was hidden. There was like this cascade of events of Twitter 
And then I'd been previously scheduled for that Joe Rogan podcast that went crazy. And, uh, you know, I like to say I said these three little words and Silicon Valley lost bladder control simultaneously of, of uh, mass formation psychosis, right? Uh, and, and the world just went crazy over those three little words. And I think it was kind of uh, almost an admission of guilt. But uh, that whole cascade of events really almost created a martyr. It's, uh, you know, the expression, there's uh, all press is good press. And I don't think Twitter probably had any anticipation that this cascade would occur. So did it surprise me? Actually kind of no. I knew it was gonna happen. I knew it was happening to a lot of my other colleagues. I knew it was an intentional strategy by Twitter. And uh, it's important to your, your audience may or may not be aware of the Trusted News Initiative. Many people aren't still, which I find fascinating. The Trusted News Initiative is managed by the British Broadcasting Corporation, and it's one of the structures that ties together all of this global information management and information control across Microsoft, Twitter, uh, MSNBC, CNN, uh, Canadian uh, Press Agency, France Press, BBC, um, Facebook, Twitter, etc are all members of the Trusted News Initiative under the leadership of the British Broadcasting Corporation. And the conditions within that system, which was set up ostensibly to block Russian interference in elections, that's why it was originally set up. And then it was repurposed for resisting vaccine mis and disinformation. And that has been weaponized. That is the central command that has guided and, and reinforced this harmonization of messaging all across the world, which has been an odd thing to encounter. Uh, and the way that that works is the definitions have been set up by the BBC and by the leadership there, I think, uh, that, that any information which is inconsistent with the current storyline being promoted by the World Health Organization or a national health authority, in our case, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the NIH. So anything which is different from what CDC, NIH, or WHO is saying is disallowed. It is defined as dis or misinformation and it will be censored and you will be deplatformed. The functionally what that means, like for your audience, is that they are not able to access any information other than the approved storyline and when you loop back to what we were saying before, this reveal on President's Day from the New York Times that the CDC has been weaponized as a political arm of the executive branch, what you have is a situation in which only propaganda is allowed by definition, okay, if you follow what I'm saying. That's functionally what's happened. Is that how we get to this mass formation psychosis or what is your definition of that? So mass formation psychosis is a fascinating topic and, and uh, it's people sometimes credit me with that, they shouldn't. It's my friend, uh, Matthias Desmet, who is a professor at University of Ghent in Belgium. And Matthias is a, a uh, full professor who spent his entire a career researching this phenomena of the formation of crowds and the growth of authoritarianism. He has a definitive book that soon will be out in, in English. It's currently printed in Dutch, um, but you can pre-buy it on Amazon. I don't get anything from it. I'm not pushing it, but you can find Matthias Desmond and it's called The Psychological Basis of Totalitarianism. And in that book and in his own research, uh, which is largely kind of a modernization of the work of Hannah Arndt, who is the premier, premier scholar in trying to understand the psychology of what happened to Germans in World War II. Okay, so he's building on top of that tradition, which is long recognized as major academic scholarly work, um, in trying to comprehend the modern version of this formation of crowds and the hypnosis that can occur and can be actively manipulated. He believes, his thesis is, that this process of mass formation and the hypnosis of large blocks of the population is accelerating during the 20th and then 21st century, largely because of the effects of mass media. 
and it is being actively done. At first, this was heresy when I said it, you know, repeating his own insights, but now we've had multiple reveals and there's an investigation ongoing within the UK about the role of the British government in the term is used nudging. Um, that uh, the British government has actively used nudging and fear to control the British population. And it's all been justified as being in the common good. One of the things that Matthias teaches, there's a whole bunch of lessons that are kind of really useful in making sense out of this. And also, I think it really helps people to come to terms with their, you know, the uncle or nephew or work friend or whatever that is so into the narrative that they can't hear anything else. And so instead of rejecting them or being angry at them or uh, feeling like somehow you have to fight with them, when you work through this theory and the logic behind it, it seems to evoke in pity in people a certain amount of pity that, that we can see how these other folks have been caught up into this process. They've been hypnotized by media and by the government and then it's much easier to forgive them, which I think is crucial. So the key parameter to oversimplify that Matthias identifies as the precursor for mass formation, and this is important in thinking about how to get out of it, the precursor is the loss of community, the fragmentation of us as community connected to each other. Um, it's that loss of connectivity that is the precursor that set this whole thing up and enables the manipulation of information and manipulation of people's minds. When we're connected, um, and one example of more highly connected communities that have been resistant, that myself and my colleagues have seen all across the world, is communities of faith. Whether you are a believer or not a believer, people who participate in communities of faith for some reason and it's not just the book of revelations, um, although many cite that, uh, for some reason they've been very resistant to this hypnosis phenomena. And I think it has a lot to do, and Matthias concurs with this, I spent a week with him in Spain. Those uh, documentaries will be coming out soon. Um, but uh, um, this, this uh, connectedness that exists within religious communities makes them much more uh, resistant to the social fragmentation, which is the precursor in a world in which we are all separated from each other because we're doing this or watching CNN or whatever, or locked down in our little rabbit hole and you know um, foxhole and, and looking out. This all creates these environments of social fragmentation. And if you think back before, you know, back to 2019 and earlier, we were all being torn apart as a body politic. We were all being pitted against each other. You know, are you woke or I'm more woke or Black Lives Matter? There's all these things that all divided us, divided us, divided us, divided us. So now we're all separate individuals in our own little world without connectivity to each other, except perhaps through this artificial medium of social information and computers, right? And then an event happened. That event was pressed in the press. It was actively manipulated by the People's Republic of China. Remember those videos of people falling down dead in the streets? That was all fraud. Okay, that, does, are, do you, have you seen anybody falling down dead in the streets here in the United States when COVID swept through? Did you see it in Europe? Did you see it in Great Britain? Did you see it in Australia or New Zealand? No, okay, that was a fraud. Not in New York okay? City. Not, not even <laughs> in New York City, okay? New York City took it hard and a bunch of mistakes were made, but people weren't dropping dead on the street. Um, they weren't dropping dead on the street in Diamond Princess in there, you know. Okay, so, so we had that information pushed at us, right, into our brains. Threat, threat, fear, 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 amplified by media. Okay, so now people have this sense of free-floating anxiety, disconnectedness, belief that the world doesn't make sense. And then a hero arrives on the scene, okay, and says... I have the solution. I have the technical solution that will solve your pain and make it all go away. That hero was Tony Fauci. That technical solution was RNA vaccines. Okay? And everybody latched onto that. Oh, this is the new belief structure. It's like a totem. Okay? 
the ma and then eventually the masks also became a totem. This is very tribal, right? And if you wanted to be in that tribe to show that you were part of that community, because what happens with this, you have all this free floating anxiety, all this social separation, and then suddenly a solution is given. People become fixated on that solution. That's how they become hypnotized. And they accept that solution and suddenly their pain of being disconnected from the world is resolved. They have meaning, their lives have meaning. There's a thing that they can do to relieve their fear and their anxiety. The belief system of the vaccines and the masks gives their life purpose. And they, the thing is, it's a very artificial community that's created. They're, even though they have joined this community and, and accepted these practices of masking that are irrational, not based in science, right? Or a, a vaccine that is neither safe nor effective, particularly with Omicron, right? But it becomes a ritual that they have to demonstrate that shows that they're part of this community and which then gives them relief from all this anxiety. But it is a false community because they're not tied to each other. They're only tied to that person and that object. That's where the authoritarianism, the totalitarianism steps in, is this cult of personality, this individual that's identified as a savior. Remember, they were selling underwear with Anthony Fauci's picture on it in New York City, right? And, and I must ask <laughs> you, because you have worked with Anthony Fauci, wh what, why, why? Uh, I, so how do I get into Tony's brain? Um, I, I, um, Tony has basically built an empire of power over decades, controlling billions of dollars. And, uh, he, he seems to have it's the best way I can express it. I've run into Tony is like the most, uh, developed example of a sickness that has swept through the entire medical research complex of these godlike laboratory head figures that control massive amounts of money. And they basically set up mafias that fight with each other. It's the mafia is the best metaphor I can come up with. Okay. They, they have lieutenants, um, and, uh, they have trainees that then go out into the world and are still part of that network, that alliance that's built. And Tony has built one of the most powerful ones. Tony, you know, remember um, uh, uh, the the people like Deborah Burks. Yep. Okay. Well, where did Deborah Burks do her postdoc? Who was her mentor? You know? No. Tony Fauci. Okay. Okay. RNA vaccines. Okay. Drew Weissman. Weissman and Carrico. Um, Ostens, you know, erstwhile Nobel laureates didn't make it um, for the development of RNA vaccines at Penn. Okay, Drew Weissman, getting huge amounts of revenue from these the patent that Penn holds. Tony Fauci postdoc. Okay, these networks exist. They pervade academia, and they compete with each other. There's all kinds of practices that they do, and Tony has become the godfather of the biggest of the big networks. Now, why does anybody seek that kind of power? There's a lot of psychological reasons for that that I don't want to go into. I'm not a shrink and neither are you. But Tony seems to have what I call a hole in his soul, um, a, a, a hole that just cannot be filled. Whatever it is, whatever cycle, you know, childhood trauma or whatever it is that happened in Tony Fauci's life, he seems to have to, a need to uh, for for aggrandizement and power and control. That's that's what we can observe. What's going on in his brain? I have no idea. Um, it it you know Bobby Kennedy and I helped edit Bobby's mm -hmm. book uh, twice. It's not a small challenge. Uh, a <laughs> a <big> lot <laughs> of pages. Uh, but but he documents this long long history in the real Anthony Fauci of these behaviors. And I've lived it my whole career. It's watching him do things that if I did them as a clinical researcher, I would lose my ability to do clinical research. I mean, even, even what's happened with the CDC withholding data 
if you think that through with me for an exa for a while, just just kind of imagine I have this massive database, and it describes this disease, and it describes all of the characteristics of this intervention, a vaccine. Okay, I have this massive database, and I decide if I'm a medical researcher. Let's imagine I'm I'm sitting at a high profile East Coast elite school, and I've got all these data. Now, this is the metaphor for the CDC and Rachel, Rochelle Walensky. Okay? But imagine if I was that person holding all that data and I said to my people, I, for, for political reasons, because we don't want to scare people of, and cause them to become more vaccine hesitant, which is a no-no, right? Mm -hmm. Cannot allow people to be vaccine hesitant. Um, that's one of the catechisms here, right? Um, I'm only going to publish part of this data. I'm going to select data that, that supports the narrative that I wish to advance. And I'm gonna disregard all the other data. I'm gonna hide it. I'm not gonna show it to anybody, okay? If I did that as a medical researcher, I would be guilty of fraud. That is the definition of withholding key data and crafting a storyline and information that, that supports some political objective that I want to promote as a scientist. If I was to do that, I would be guilty of fraud. I would expect to be kicked out of my university, never be able to get another grant, never be able to do clinical research. And yet we accept it from Tony and from the CDC. We accept that Dr. Fauci substitutes his personal opinion and his personal interests, such as hiding his role and that of Francis Collins and that of the director of, uh, of the major Wellcome Trust in the UK in funding the Wuhan laboratory research that generated this virus. So how do we hold anyone accountable? So um, recently, I you can find my publications on rwmalonemd.substack.com. That's my longer forms. And you can see my daily grind coming out on Getter and Gab also. But in particular, I direct you to a recent one that I put out concerning Mr. Ron Johnson. What we have to do is we have to flip the Senate and the House. We have to flip it in such a, to such an extent that this problem of uniparty, where people like Mitt Romney are really more aligned with the Democrats than they really are with those that want to have substantial reform, that want to hold people accountable. There has to be enough of a wave election in both Senate and House. And Ron Johnson, as you know, has, for, for us, the doctors, we are so grateful for everything he's done. Let me say something about Ron. I, we did a little intervention, the, the physicians, uh, last fall, early winter, where we visited a bunch of senators and people in the House, um, uh, Congress people. And um, I was with the Senate delegation, and I walked into Ron Johnson's office with a mental image of Ron Johnson as somebody who was uh, a conspiracy theorist, who was unhinged, because this is what the press has been promoting. Mm -hmm. you know, they took things that he did and innocent comments that he's made and amplified him as saying that he was asserting that mouthwash was an effective treatment for SARS-CoV-2. I mean, this is absolutely not what he said, but it's how they crafted that narrative and tried to position him, okay? And I came in with this idea in my mind. I went to school in Chicago. I get the Midwest, okay? And, um, and I walk in and there's this kind of straight arrow Midwestern businessman who's friendly, upstanding, absolutely not crazy. And I had this moment of cognitive dissonance where I suddenly became acutely aware of how I had been manipulated by the press in my expectations of Ron Johnson. Since then, he's become a good friend. And he, he tells the story that part of the reason why he's decided to run again is because of me. I'm very honored by that, but that in speaking out, it's giving, given him a sense of courage and purpose and that there is some hope. Not just me, but um, Ryan Cole and uh, Pierre Corey and uh, um, uh, Peter McCullough and so many others that have participated in his various hearings, 
But he's on fire now. It's important to remember that he comes from a state and a long tradition in his own office, in his own career, of being pro-pharma, of being a supporter of the pharmaceutical industry. And he feels deeply betrayed by what's happened. He feels deeply betrayed by the pharmaceutical industry. And he is on fire. The thing is, if he's reelected and and they take the Senate and they take the House, particularly the Senate, he will become ranking member in the Senate subcommittee on investigations. And that will give him subpoena power. Right now, they can't subpoena anybody. They can't force Tony Fauci to come and give testimony. Then they will be able to. That's why he's been holding these hearings. It's not just for atmospherics, you know, and publicity. He's setting up his position for what he wants to do if he's reelected. So we've got to, you know, somehow patriots. I mean, that's now to say, isn't that bizarre? To say patriots is equivalent almost of saying Nazis in, in the modern vernacular of the press, yeah. right? To be somebody who's a supporter of the Constitution, of the Bill of Rights, is somehow considered a right-wing radical position. Wow. Have they managed to reframe the whole dialogue? But you ask, what can we do? In my opinion, people have got to become aware those of us that are not completely hypnotized, that most importantly, their children's future is at risk here. And um, if you value the world that you're going to give to your children, as I do, um, and if you value living in a world in which you have free will to make your own decisions economically, I mean, to underscore, look at what happened to the truckers under Justin Trudeau, okay, they shut down their bank accounts. They blocked their ability. I'm going to tell you a story, Allison. So the truckers have been, I've been in communication with the Canadian truckers and the U.S. truckers. I'm not part of their leadership, but they, the physicians and the truckers have this common cause. And as they were getting kicked out of the state, the, the national capital in Canada, I was asked to cut a little short video with Ryan Cole in support of them as they were moving out of the capital to be played during a pig roast that a farmer, rural farmer, was going to hold for the truckers as they were moving out of Ottawa. Okay? The government heard about the pig roast for the, for the truckers and blocked that farmer's bank account, blocked his ability to get access to his own money. That's, that's where we're at. If that's the world you want to live in, if you want to live in a world in which basically a, a cabal in the European Union, uh, we know of them as the party of Davos, uh, but they're also known as the World Economic Forum, and under that, Bilderberg Group, um, if, if you, those people believe that they have the right to um, manage the world. And they, there's uh, policies in place now, there's legislation in the European Union to reinstate all the mandates. There's legislation in progress in the UN and the World Health Organization that is coming up that we may well sign off on, we the United States, that will say that in the event of a public health emergency, the constitution of the UN and the World Health Organization will supersede national constitutions. It's right there. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's real. If that's the world you want to live in, a world in which the idea of a nation state is considered obsolete, that's the world that we're moving towards. And you can stand up now and try to do something about it at the ballot box. And there's a lot of cynicism about whether the ballot box is even a viable option anymore. But it's kind of all we've got. If, if there's a large enough wave at the midterms, I think we've got a chance. So that's my answer. Now, beyond that, even if, if the House and the Senate flip, we've still got two years under this uh, executive branch. And even if that flips, the damage that has occurred in terms of, of your listenership, public at large, our faith in the public health care system in the United States, insurance industry, hospital industry, physicians, HHS is so profoundly shaken 
that that it is going to take a really hard lift to to repair ourselves. It kind of sounds from what you're saying that a possibility to repair is bringing communities together physically, Thank physically you. Thank you. bringing communities so together. So I like to always close and or mention in my various talks three key words, integrity, dignity, and community. In, in my thesis is that we have to recommit ourselves to those three concepts. And Matthias teaches that the real root cause is the loss of community. And as you, thank you for bringing us back to community. Um, an example of that, which Matthias predicted, Desmond, um, is that if that a new focus could arise and the hypnotized crowd will switch their focus from COVID and the vaccines to that new event, but it will still be the same structure. It will still be the same underlying illness. And we have Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we have exactly the same people exhibiting exactly the same kind of crowd behavior um, and retaliation against people that aren't, you know, demonstrating sufficient fealty to this new narrative that's being promoted in a harmonized way globally by press and governments and social media, etc. And it's just caused them to pivot. Yeah. And the real problem is, as you correctly point out, that they have lost community and interconnectedness with each other. And so they can be controlled by these kinds of structures like media. Well, hopefully we'll have more community coming together. And with that, develop more critical thinkers. Yep. So that's the idea that instead of the Great Reset, we have the Great Awakening. And I think that's a great place to close. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure spending the day with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Alice.